Daphne du Maurier's 1938 novel Rebecca is a timeless gothic romance charting the course of the tumultuous and spontaneous marriage of an unnamed protagonist and an emotionally traumatized widower through jealousy, suspicion, and intrigue. The book has spent over 80 years in print, sold millions of copies, been celebrated for generations, and owns a place on Alfred Hitchcock's resume of iconic thrillers. Well said. Thank you. But here we are in Lo These Modern Times, and Netflix has tasked director Ben Wheatley to take another crack at the classic source material. But how do you adapt something this classic? No, like really, how'd they do it? Well, we thought we'd actually ask the filmmaker this time around. How's it going, Ben? It's good, man. How you doing? Good. Good to meet you. It's time to ask Ben Wheatley, what's the difference? Because I have no idea if Rebecca is on high school curriculums anymore, here are the basics of the story. The protagonist, a young woman who famously never gets a name of her own, meets the dashing widower Maxim de Winter in Monte Carlo. After a brief courtship, Maxim pops the question, changing our nameless protagonist's life forever. They return to Maxim's renowned estate, Manderley, where a mystery begins to unravel as the new Mrs. de Winter lives in the shadow of the titular Rebecca, Maxim's first wife, who everybody thought was just the best, including and especially the icy and overbearing head of the house, Mrs. Danvers. The result is a very interesting mix of genres. It's almost like she's trolling the audience. Like She goes, oh, you like romances. You know, you want to see a romantic thing? I'll show you something romantic. This is a guy, he's a widow, and he meets this, this um, woman, and they fall in love on holiday, and that's fantastic. You love that stuff. And then she just then proceeds to completely destroy that character. You know, you, it's almost like you could never read a romance novel again after you've read Rebecca. Yeah, it goes to some strange places, but let's start at the very beginning, shall we? Perhaps one of the most iconic things about the book is the opening line. Last night, I dreamt I went to Manderley again. And because it's in the running for the most iconic opening line of anything, there was never a question that that's where the movie had to start as well. Right, Ben? I mean, that was always going to be it, because the whole structure of the thing is that, and in the book and as in the film, that it's it's not just a memory of something. You're not being just told a story, you're being told a memory of a dream. And the book itself uses kind of quite cinematic um, technique in, t in terms of the fracturing of time. That kind of fed back into the adaptation. The novel opens with a meandering chapter with a dreamlike quality. The narrator's memories bounce around through the breadth of her time at Manderley, describing the grounds, the sights and sounds, and of course Mrs. Danvers gets a mention on page two. In a straightforward chronology, you wouldn't meet either the estate at Manderley or Mrs. Danvers until a third of the way through the narrator's story. Which is quite surprising, you know, you think it's going to be much more linear than that. The authors do it for a reason, and it's and you're, you're, you should not fight the author, because the author is always going to be the smartest person in the room anyway. Why is Danvers in the first few pages of the book? It's because you want to see that stuff up front. The audience wants to know about it. Every decision from that point on is always through the filter of that character. The feeling of that opening line is adapted to the screen throughout the film, setting up the retelling of a dream through the edit. Scenes are intercut with just hints of other scenes, flashes of images that evoke the feeling of a different time. It's a subtle visual solution in a film for what Du Maurier was able to deliver with the text in her novel. The idea that the thing is a dream is as old as the hills, you know, to have a movie that's a drama and then you, or any story where you woke up and it was all a dream is dangerous game, you know, you do, you, you need to avoid it. It's a fine line where you want, you want to keep to the logic of, or the, to keep to the facts of the thing is a memory, it's, it's not even just a memory, but a memory of a dream. So there's layers and layers and layers to it. But then at the same time, you don't want to lose the audience to the fact that, that, that they suddenly think, oh, I don't, I don't need to follow this that closely because it's a dream. But, Narratively, the book and the movie also proceed in much the same way during their time in Monte Carlo. Our narrator, or protagonist, which by the way, what did you call her? What is she in the script before she's the new Mrs. De Winter? Is I couldn't possibly she... tell you, I'd have to kill oh, okay. you if I told <laughs> okay, you. Okay, copy that. How about just the future Mrs. De Winter for now? Anyway, she's in Monte Carlo as a lady's companion to the American and very wonderfully awful Mrs. Van Hopper, the epitome of a tacky socialite. Thank you, Mrs. Van Hopper. <laughs> The book and the movie play the same beats, with the future Mrs. De Winter sneaking away for rendezvous with Maxim after Mrs. Van Hopper takes ill. They take drives and have lunches and talk and just generally fall in love, but all the while the future Mrs. De Winter is hit with stories of the great love Maxim shared with Rebecca, whether it be stories from Mrs. Van Hopper, a distant stare from Maxim, or an inscribed book of poetry. The main differences show up as the adaptation's modern updates to the story begin to show. The film version in 2020 obviously had more leeway to deal explicitly with sex, 
both the having of it on a beach and Mrs. Van Hopper's salty reaction. While Book Van Hopper simply implies the narrator has been doing something she ought not, Movie Van Hopper goes full crass. When you trap a man between your legs, they don't stick around for long. But the most obvious difference in this first section is the age difference. Book Maxim is in his 40s, while the narrator is in her early 20s. Army Hammer and Lily James play as much closer in age. And where the book leans on the future Mrs. De Winter's youth as the source of her uneasiness, with nearly every character the narrator included almost constantly treating her like a child, the movie leans more towards the issue of social status. The future Mrs. De Winter fumbles her way through tipping, looks out of place in the lobby of a fancy hotel, and she even commits the ultimate faux pas in polite society, repeating French words she overheard and accidentally ordering oysters for breakfast. Ooh, ghastly. But nowhere is the shift in emphasis from age to status more clear than in a scene that was added to the movie from scratch. The future Mrs. De Winter, laying in her bed in the next room, overhears Mrs. Van Hopper talking some serious about her. And while Du Maurier could simply write that the future Mrs. De Winter was having these thoughts, in the visual medium of cinema, we had to see it. There's something to be said about the world of the narrative bullying the main character. The more you see a character being dragged through the mud, whether it's physically or just in that in that kind of sense of just being talked about, the more you kind of side with them. Because, and also it's the kind of human level understanding. You know what that is. You know how excruciating that would be. You've, you know, everybody's experienced something like that. And so there's a direct contact between you, the character and the, and the audience in a way that maybe the, the higher ticket kind of melodrama moments are harder to swallow because maybe you haven't um, been involved in some you know, a grand romance where you were embarrassed at a party with thousands of people there, but just the little aggressions. So that, that kind of stuff all, all pays to when you're feeling sympathy for the character and then, you, then you're then caught into the film, really. The small and intimate scene with the narrator is just one of several subtle things the movie does to adapt her character to the screen. In the book, she's more timid and frequently left out of conversations altogether. For example, when Maxim tells Mrs. Van Hopper about the engagement, he has the super close to being Mrs. De Winter wait outside while he goes in to speak with her employer. Movie almost Mrs. De Winter, however, takes a more active role in the burgeoning relationship literally getting behind the wheel at times, saying things out loud to Maxim that are only her thoughts in the book, and at the very least standing there next to Maxim while they talk to Mrs. Van Hopper. But this isn't simply a case of updating the narrator to feel like a more modern woman. It gets at a different aspect of adaptations altogether. The main thing we found is there was a gap between what she was saying in the book and what her actions were. That was the gap that we could open up to change some of the things on screen. And I think that maybe sometimes when you do an adaptation, like an absolute nuts and bolts line for line adaptation of what's said or described on in the book is not necessarily going to get to the essence of the book. Because there's a bit of a thing that De Maurier is playing in terms of how reliable she is as reporting this stuff, that maybe if you then just take her at face value, you actually misrepresent the book in many ways. Once the couple is married and properly honeymooned across Europe, they return to Maxim's home at Manderley. And finally, we get a look at the estate that was mentioned in the famous opening line. The book and movie again line up for a stretch. In both mediums, Maxim gets colder to Mrs. De Winter upon their return, and the same cast of supporting characters begin to weigh more heavily in the proceedings. None more so than Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers, the distant and intimidating head of house at Manderley, was a big fan of Rebecca's going way back, and is very much not a fan of the new Mrs. De Winter showing up in her old mistress's digs. As soon as they return to Mandalay, the promise of the first chapter arrives and the story shifts gears. Right away, Danvers makes Mrs. De Winter's life a living hell. What was, for a lengthy bit of runtime, a romantic whirlwind through Europe becomes the story of a young woman constantly confronted with insecurities that come with her new station in life and the manipulative way Mrs. Danvers never lets her forget. Another character that features heavily in the story is Rebecca's cousin, Jack Favell. In the novel, he pays an unexpected visit to Manderley. Mrs. De Winter, who in the book is far less confrontational, sneaks about the ground, spying, as Mrs. Danvers secrets him around the house till she's finally caught red-handed. Movie Mrs. De Winter meets Favell herself as she sees the stranger showing up at her home. However, after a super uncomfortable horse riding lesson, Favell leaves Mrs. De Winter with a bigger mystery as to why he ended up at Manderley and who really invited him. 
one that leads a more active than she is in the book Mrs. De Winter to confront Mrs. Danvers in front of the entire staff. And while that confrontation doesn't go well, it leads to another scene invented for the movie in which Danvers appears vulnerable and sympathetic. There's even a connection between the pair in the movie as they begin to prepare for the Manderley Ball, a tradition started by the much beloved Rebecca. In the book, Danvers never seems so generous to Mrs. De Winter. In fact, when it comes to planning the Manderley Ball, the new Mrs. De Winter is left again on the sideline. The only interaction she has with Danvers is when the head of the house suggests modeling her costume off an old family portrait of Maxim's favorite aunt. Aunt. Aunt, right? Aunt. In the movie, that suggestion comes via Mrs. De Winter's maid, Clarice, but ultimately, like the book, originated from Mrs. Danvers as part of her plot to, well, ruin Mrs. De Winter's entire life, a plot that is wildly successful up to this point. But the change is not an insignificant one. Choosing which parts of which character's plots to obfuscate is one of the finer arts of adaptation. It's tricky because there's things in, uh, in books that just don't translate into film. They just can't. I always think about it in terms of like the book is, is the room's dark and the author's got a torch and they slowly shine the torch around the room and they describe what they see. But then a film is like you go in the room and the room's lit up. It's every, you see everything and you can't hide from any of it. It's all just there in your face and you go, oh yeah, I know this room. The Moriah can point at something over there and something massive is over here that if we saw it, we just go, well, that's ridiculous. But you never see it because you're only getting that tiny flow of information. And that's a literary thing. You just, it doesn't have a, a version in cinema. So then you just have to start making decisions about how how it works for you and what those kinds of choices are. One of the bigger choices of the adaptation occurs through the middle of the story around a huge turning point that shifts the narrative into yet another genre, murder mystery. Both the book and the movie feature the same events. When a ship runs aground in the cove near Manderley, divers discover another boat underneath it. The boat Rebecca was thought to have drowned in. Ooh. Maxim had previously identified the body of his wife having washed ashore a long distance north of Manderley, so everyone's got questions for him, most of all his new wife. And so he fesses up. Turns out Rebecca was an unfaithful woman and legitimately pretty awful to Maxim. And one night when she gave him the chance, Maxim killed her, put her in the boat, and poked holes in it until it sank. From Mrs. De Winter being mortified at the Manderley Ball, through her extreme self-doubt afterwards, on into the ship running aground in the cove, the discovery of Rebecca's boat with a dead body inside, Maxim's confession, in the book, that all takes place over several chapters and a week or more. In the movie, however, it's compressed into what may only be around 24 hours. You know, a lot of those things happen, those compressions of time, because otherwise you're just stuck with a load of wakings up and going to beds and light coming up and going down. And these are all things that kill films. You know, you don't you don't really want to see all that stuff. The film features a hallucinatory panic attack that stands in for a chapter's worth of Mrs. De Winter being in her own head, a dramatic confrontation with Danvers where she tries to talk Mrs. De Winter into suicide, and during his confession, Maxim offers his new wife a gun and the same opportunity Rebecca had offered him, a murderous way out. But in keeping with her movie version's updates, Mrs. De Winter starts to carry the team, so to speak. She even gets a cool little suiting up montage. And by the time the legal proceedings begin, there's a different reason for the compression. And then also we just had this conversation about what is the actual legal reality of all this stuff? Who's arresting him? Why is he being held at the police station? What, what who are these people? What is the actual, you know, the, the process of law here? What is that court he gets taken to? Does that make any sense? The longer that process goes on, the more questions the audience has about what, what, what is going on, you know. As we come to the end of the story, in the book, after the first day of court proceedings, Favell comes to Manderley to blackmail the De Winters. And that's really the only structural similarity the movie keeps. There is an issue with the end of the book. They go to Pinner and they talk to the doctor and the doctor goes, she died of cancer. And then they all just stand there and go, oh yeah. And Favell goes, all right then, see you later. They all kind of go, Ugh. and then the house burns down and that's the ending. It, it, it's a problem, you know, in terms of cinema. The film, however, is very different, largely because of how the second Mrs. De Winter is steering the ship. After Favelle blackmails the De Winters, she's the one who sees what he's really after. Following the payoff, literally everything is brand new for the movie. A second day of court proceedings where Favelle double crosses them, Maxim being held in prison, leaving Mrs. De Winter to engage in a high speed pursuit, and some light breaking and entering to find out Rebecca was dying of cancer when she goaded Maxim into killing her. It's enough evidence for the authorities to believe the story that Rebecca killed herself, letting Maxim off the hook. The thing I really appreciated from the Jane Goldman script was that to kind of go, well, okay, she can have some more agency at the end, uh, but we'll also get her involved in the 
the, the finding out of what happened and the un unraveling of the uh, of the uh, mystery. But the changes to the end don't stop there. There's more? Oh, you bet your bippy there's more. Oh, not my bippy. In addition to actually seeing Danvers light the fire at Manderley, there's one additional scene for the film we don't get in the book. Danvers leaping off a cliff and into the sea where her beloved Rebecca was found. It's all hinted at that that's what's happened and she's last seen running off somewhere. And But yeah, the book ends a lot earlier. It just ends with the fire in the distance. But I think it would have been a hard sell for the audience. Again, it makes a lot of sense in the book, but the, in, the, in a visual medium, it, it, it's like you're going, oh, something brilliant's happening over there, but we're not going to show you, which is like the worst thing you can do to a cinema audience. They're just furious, you know. Go, oh, right, okay. Oh, remember that really indelible character that you, you're really invested in? You don't get to see them again either, that's it, they're gone. And so the story of the second Mrs. De Winter comes to a close. What started as a naive love affair in Monte Carlo transitioned into a swirl of self-doubt and jealousy, which then turned into a protagonist on the wrong side of a murder investigation. But it's the last section of the story that contains Du Maurier's most compelling trick and one of the biggest goals of this adaptation. She then implicates the reader into all of this, so that not only are you looking at all these characters flying around inside this maelstrom, but you become one of them, you know, and then once you realize that you're rooting for the main characters to win, you start to have this kind of uh, awkward thought that maybe you're on the wrong side of the story, you know, and that the the people that you were hoping to win are the, are the villains of the piece to a degree. So that was that was kind of what drew it drew me into it. In the first adaptation, there was worries, all, apart from the Hayes Code, which they weren't allowed to show the um, uh, someone committing a crime and getting away with it. There was also an idea that if you make the main, one of the main characters a murderer, then it just it destroys audience sympathy and destroys the film, you know. But De Moray knew that wasn't true because the book was so massively successful. But is it possible in a film? And, and how do you do that? You know, and how do you bring it to the end? And, and what is the feeling of that by the time you hit the end? So that was, that was the big goal. And that, how do you manage that? That's awesome. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate the time. Cheers, man. Thank you. And another very special thanks to Netflix and Ben Wheatley for talking to us about Rebecca. So, what do you think of this new format? Would you like to see us roll more filmmakers into the show if we can? Let us know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more What's the Difference.